Hello everyone, uh, my name's Tom and I'm one of the team here at Hay House UK and it's my great pleasure today to be talking to Sangeeta Iyer who is the author of this fantastic book Gods in Shackles. Um, Sangeeta, how are you today? I am good, it's quite warm here in Toronto but um, this is how you know the whole planet is changing but I'm good generally, yes. That's great, glad to hear it. Um, just before we begin, I thought for anybody who's watching who might not be familiar with you and your work, would you mind kind of um, giving us a little bit of background about you, uh, your work and, uh, and what it is that you do? Of course. I am actually a nature and wildlife filmmaker. Uh, I'm a former broadcast journalist with a background in biology and master's in environmental education and communication. And um, I produce approximately 47 short films. My... Um, Life came to full circle when I produced this film called Gods in Shackles. And so the film was nominated to the United Nations General Assembly and it won about 13 International Film Festival awards. And I didn't produce the movie to get all of those awards and accolades, but one thing, uh, you know, turned into the next and it, it, the whole, the whole, um, journey unfolded and uh, I ended up writing this book called Gods and Shackles, What Elephants Can Teach Us About Empathy, Resilience and Freedom, because I wanted to discuss how this whole journey into the making of the documentary itself unfolded. So it's like a journey into the journey. Yeah. Nice. And the, the book and the film have actually acted as something of a springboard uh, for activism on your part, haven't they? Uh, because yes. the reason we we sort of connected is uh, because Sangeeta recently visited uh, the UK Houses of Parliament. Um, do you mind telling us a little bit about uh, your visit to Parliament and uh, the work that you've been doing with uh, British politicians? Absolutely. The reason that I approached uh, the Member of Parliament, Mr Henry Smith, uh, whom, by the way, I have known him since 2018, and I met him through my film called Gods and Shackles. And um, I had explained to him about the plight of captive and wild elephants. And, you know, a lot of people always ask me, there are so many animals that suffer. Yes, there are. The reason that I chose to advo this advocacy for elephants is because elephants are environmentally significant because they are mega herbivores. Elephants are the largest living land mammal on the planet. And so their demise is going to have a cascading effect on the entire planet. We are already experiencing the ravages of climate change. I just mentioned when you asked me how you're doing, it's hot. And you know, in many countries around the world, uh, they are experiencing extreme weather events, you know, the heat, the temperature has surpassed historic records. And we are seeing uh, intense storm surges, intense precipitation, monsoon rains in India, you know, killing hundreds of people every single year, landslides. All these climatic changes are intensifying. And what do all those environmental catastrophes have to do with elephants? Well, elephants have been linked with mitigating climate change. And this is something that the International Monetary Authority, the International Monetary Fund has actually proven that one single African forest elephant actually sequesters some $1.75 million per square kilometer wow. of carbon you know, in sequestration. So that's the value of every single elephant. So to me, protecting this elephant is so critically significant, not just because of the ecosystem values that they offer, but because they are supremely intelligent, highly social animals. They actually teach human beings life transforming lessons. They are cultural icons in many parts of the world. And I was seeing, I was witnessing with my own eyes their demise and I wanted to do something. I could not just stand by and be, a, you know, be a witness without doing anything. And so this is why I produced the film called Gods and Shackles. But then I also wanted to sort of 
expand this and sort of like have this global outreach. And so um, I had been in consultations with Mr. Henry Smith since 2018. And uh, finally, he said, uh, this is really getting very critical and the crisis is just intense because in the last three years alone, uh, 245 elephants have been killed. And, you know, some people will say, well, it's only 245 elephants. There are thousands and thousands of people who get killed. But here's the difference, right? Elephants can give birth to babies only every five years. And so we, they are disappearing at a much rapid rate than they're able to keep up. They are not able to produce as many kids. And there are approximately only 40,000 Asian elephants on the entire planet. And 60% of them, that is 27,000, are in India. And there's always been like a deep connection between the United Kingdom and India. And so I felt like this would be a good, you know, sort of um, stepping stone to sort of amplify the plight of the Indian elephants. And it seems to have resonated very well. That's great to hear. Um, is, it, is it the case that these elephants are being slaughtered? Is this largely to do with the ivory trade or is this, or are there, are there other factors at work in this? Yeah, there are so many factors at work. Of course, ivory trade is a major factor, but here's the difference between African and Asian elephants. Ivory is a huge factor in Africa. You know why? Because both male and female African elephants, they have tusks. Right. Whereas when it comes to Asian elephants, only bull elephants have tusks. Female elephants don't have tusks. But here's the issue we are facing. Only 4.4% of the entire Asian elephant population in India are bull elephants, only 4.4%. So out of the 27,000 Asian elephants, only approximately 1,200 of them are bull elephants because they are being slaughtered at an alarming late rate. Poaching is intensifying. And of course, during COVID, you know, there were, there were no, the forests were not being patrolled, you know, during the COVID lockdown in the last three years. And so poaching intensified even more. And, but there are other factors. You see, just this year, India has surpassed the human population record at 1.41 billion people. Wow. You know, they've surpassed China. So, and, and, and to provide you with some perspective, India's space land mass is only 10% that of the whole continent of Africa. So Africa has 1.43 billion people, the whole continent of Africa. Whereas India, which is just a country which is one-tenth the size of Africa, houses 1.41 billion people, almost the same amount. And so the competition for space is at an all-time high. 80% of all of the elephant habitats have been decimated. And so what is happening is that elephants are entering the villages because they don't have enough food. They don't have enough water inside the forest. And so they're leaving the forest and they're coming to find food. And obviously people are terrified and you know what they're doing is they're, um, and, and of course elephants are entering the cropland because as soon as they come out of the forest, they are just entering to the cropland because the forest fringes have all been occupied by people. And so uh, the conflict, ele human elephant conflict is intensifying. And what people are doing is they're creating illegal high voltage fencing. They're building these fencing okay. around their cropland and elephants are getting electrocuted and killed. 33% of all elephant deaths in India are caused by electrocution. Oh, and wow. then Yes, and 25% of all of the elephant deaths in India are caused by the reckless railways, the reckless trains, speeding trains. So uh, one of the things that's happening is that the forests, as I mentioned, they've all been fragmented. Uh, why? Because in order to sustain the burgeoning human population, 1.41 billion, Roadways are cutting through the forest. Railways are cutting through core forest areas. And trains are driving at a reckless speed 
and by the time and elephants being a migratory species they have the um their pathways ingrained in their mind they cannot get out it's like over gener several generations this pathway has been embedded in their mind the knowledge has been passed down from generation to generation so no matter what comes their way this is their pathway this is what they know so they cross and when they cross they're getting killed en masse like three four five elephants the entire herd of seven elephants got wiped out in west bengal little okay. baby elephants are getting killed so there are so many factors um, aside from poaching but 33% caused by electrocution 25% caused by the reckless railway deaths poaching is yet an intensifying as i mentioned and then there are you know other factors like poisoning people are also poisoning these animals and they're getting killed so there are so many factors oh, shocking is the indian government take um taking any action to address this are, they, are there any programs for educating the population or anything like that and that's why i actually was lobbying at the uh, uk parliament because you know the the rate or the pace at which any change is happening is just too slow the wheels of bureaucracy the wheels of you know ego centered thinking i mean it's just been incredibly frustrating to watch that even the wildlife protection act that had been working to a certain degree even that has been watered down most recently the forest protection act has also been watered down and so in order to sustain the human population development 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 is the mantra mm. and so what's happening is all these wires are traveling and through the forest and these wires are sagging uh, through the forest and when elephants come in contact boom instantly they are killed none of them are insulated and there are so many of these basic maintenance factors that can actually prevent 33% of man made deaths and so this is what i have been this is why i produced the short uh, short film series uh, 26 part short film series funded by national geographic society by the way i'm also a national geographic explorer and so i produced this 26 part short documentary series to expose all of the challenges that elephants are facing and they were featured uh, on world uh, i mean during the world earth day um just this past april and they're going to be featured on world elephant day coming up on uh, august the 12th as well and so yeah there's there's lots more work to be done and at a faster pace and you know there's just no sense of urgency and this is why i'm actually now approaching several global um uh leaders uh, which is what i did with the uk now we are trying uh, the us parliament and canadian parliament as well and i'm just going to continue to talk so people realize that this is something that needs to be addressed right now as such biodiversity loss is already exacerbating climate change and elephants they promote forest growth you know and i'll talk about that in a bit And, and how receptive have you uh, found um, these other institutions you've been approaching thus far? Yeah, so um, they are shocked, and not a lot of people are aware of the um, ecosystem values of elephants. Not a lot of people understand that by protecting elephants, you end up protecting a whole bunch of. uh species and at the same time you're also protecting forest ecosystems around the world so here's how it works right elephants when they wander there as i mentioned elephants are a migratory species and when they wander across vast areas for hours on end 15 to 18 hours a day what they do is they disperse seeds in their dung and you know one single elephant dumps some 300 pounds of dung each day wow one single elephant 300 That's pounds amazing. of dung <laughs> and i know right it's like a whole lot of poop and in that poop the elephants they carry rich seeds you know and so they dump a little bit here they walk or they dump a little bit there but they also consume some 150 or 200 wide varieties of 
barks, berries, fruits, seeds, and all of these, and they can digest only about 30 to 35 percent of what they eat the balance of the stuff just comes out of the poop this is how their body is designed they have a hind gut digestive system unlike the cattle that have like the foregut they so they keep mm. regurgitating and chewing and chewing and chewing and chewing and so they kind of make it into a paste whereas elephants they dump wholesome seeds this is why what you, everything they do you know is actually helping protect biodiversity, helping mitigate climate change, helping other species survive. You know, when elephants wander across vast areas, as I mentioned, they create pathways because they are the largest living land mammal with highest, you know, like they're big, massive and mm. with high dexterity and strength and power. And so the if if elephants did not create those pathways, the other animals cannot drink water. They cannot eat food. They cannot. So there's this cascading effect that would take place. If elephants collapse, other species will start declining. If those species decline, the ecosystems will collapse. If ecosystems collapse, there will be no carbon sequestration because seeds become trees and trees give us oxygen oxygen to breathe and take up the carbon dioxide we put into the atmosphere trees are actually natural air purifiers and plus they you know elephants also promote the growth of hardwood trees because what they do is they trample over softwood trees and they open up the pathways as i mentioned they also pull down tall canopies because elephants are the only animals who have this elastic trunk mm. that they can stretch and stretch and stretch and stretch and pull down canopies open up the forest allowing rain and sunshine to penetrate the soil and that is what is needed for the growth of hardwood trees and hardwood trees have such heavy circumference and you know the trunk and everything so they can absorb a lot more carbon so as you can see i mean i can go on and on about the magnificent values ecosystem values that elephants bring but they also teach us some deep spiritual lessons as well absolutely no i mean this is it's this is absolutely fascinating i wasn't myself i wasn't aware that elephants contributed such so significantly to uh, to the world's ecosystem um another aspect of um the endangerment of uh, elephants in india which i think you explore both in the book and the film is um the cultural use of elephants um in india um is this kind of cultural use you know temple elephants and everything is that contributing to the demise of elephants in india specifically absolutely and so let me just explain the cultural significance of elephants first and then i'll talk about the ecological disaster that ensues when they capture elephants from the wild so elephants are considered the embodiment of lord ganesh and lord ganesh is a hindu god with an elephant face and he's considered the remover of all obstacles who gives us prosperity strength and courage he's considered to be a wise god and really when you think of elephants obviously they remove all obstacles make sure that you're not in their way right um, they'll clear up all the obstacles and they'll just keep heading they're strong they're dexterous and they're dynamic majestic animals and then um, with regards to wisdom elephants are so wise their brain size is three times as large as human brain their cortical brain which is situated right between the eyes considered to be the seat of consciousness the third eye in our hindu religion you know this is it is so highly evolved that you know they every action they take everything they do is so thoughtful when you're in their presence and if they don't feel threatened by you they will do nothing what they'll do is they'll assess you and only people who know how they assess you will understand oh they're assessing me they'll just dangle one of their one of their foot like this the front foot and they'll just kind of it's like hmm, like how we do this right and we are like huh oh, that kind of thing this is how they think and they assess you and they you know they question themselves is this going to be uh, is this this person going to harm me or am i okay and they will do nothing i have been so blessed to be in front of these 
absolute majestic animals, herds and herds of them in the three years that I filmed the 26 part short docu-series, you know? And so it's important to remember that when these elephants are taken from the forest, it has a cascading effect. So on the one hand, they, you know, worship and revere this embodiment of Lord Ganesh. On the other hand, these same elephants are exploited for profit. They are brutalized because you can just imagine capturing an elephant is a brutal operation. Mm. It's an enormous, I mean, elephants are enormous. You know, they weigh tons and I mean, so many tons, right? And so I think each elephant weighs some thousand tons or something. But uh, I mean, I could be wrong, but I think that's kind of accurate. But mm -hmm. they are so heavy. So you can imagine the amount of force that you need to put on them to capture them. They are captured brutally with chains and ropes. And then they are beaten viciously using real horrific weapons like bull hooks and long poles with pointed metal ends and poked and prodded in their joints to inflict maximum pain because when they suffer so much pain, that's when they obey. This is why elephant back rides have to be completely banned around the world because elephants don't deserve to be treated in this manner. If people want entertainment, we are in a technocratic era. There are so many other ways to entertain you. Go watch a movie. Go and, you know, enjoy yourself in the natural world or go play some Nintendo game. Go technology. is like rampant everywhere. You don't need these. You don't need to torture these live elephants. You know what I mean? And you can use technology to create you know, uh, robotic elephants, I'm so excited to share with you that our organization, Voice for Asian Elephant Society, which is an organization that I founded to address all of the issues that we are discussing, we are commissioning the creation of a robotic elephant, uh, a life-size robotic elephant who's wow. going to be used in festivals to tell people, hey, you can, you know, honor your culture, but at the same time, we can make sure that we don't exploit these poor animals. And so there is a section of population uh, that actually make an enormous amount of profit. And so it's like I call them the elephant mafia and mm. they would do anything to quash you. And so this is why when I produced the film, I faced a lot of death threats. I, you know, I received nasty emails. Yes. Facebook messages. It's like, get out of our way. Don't, you are a, an enemy of culture. And so this is what they use culture to rally up the minds of people because oh, culture yeah. is so deeply ingrained in India. The minute people think, even think that, you know, you are going against the culture, but I am not because I am also very, very, I really I am a practicing Hindu, and that's because Hinduism is not a religion. It's a philosophy. It's a lifestyle. Hinduism is a lifestyle. And so I'm 100% vegan. I don't eat any meat, um, and I, I really spend time in nature. I really love reading Hindu books, you know, holy books like the Holy Bhagavad Gita, because it gives, us, gives me a lot of knowledge and cultural connection, all of these things. So, but they will do anything to make you appear like you're, you know, trying to ex, um, sort of be an enemy of the culture or that you are trying to trash the culture, which I really am not doing. All I'm trashing is the exploitation of elephants, and they are the ones who are actually using Hinduism or Christianity or Islam because now they're using it in churches and mosques as well, using elephants because yeah. Hindu people are using it in the temples. Others are saying, well, we're going to use it as well if yeah. we're going to get a piece of the economic pie and they're exploiting them. They mint money. Each elephant is rented out for approximately 100,000 bucks per festival. Like it, wow. you, US dollars, that is. Like they mint money. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so it's just, um, so if, if it was related to culture, then my question to you is, then why are you charging? Why, where's all the money going, you know? Mm -hmm. And so this is what people need to start analyzing and thinking. And I have a feeling after my movie was released in 2016, people are awakening, they are questioning the motives. And there are so many, I mean, activism 
has really expanded. There are so many activists speaking out. And th just recently, about three weeks ago or four weeks ago, when I was in uh, London, actually, there was a massive protest happening in Kerala. So these things are happening. But I just, and it's picking up pace. I think, I just feel like there's little happening here, little happening here, and maybe there's going to be a tsunami of changes that happen all at once. So it's all brewing a little bit, tiny storms here, but it's all going to come together to, to make the perfect storm, storm for change. Yeah. Well, let's hope so. Yeah, I mean, that's... Um... It's really, it's really disappointing to think about the, the ways that sort of money making, you know, corrupts absolutely everything. I mean, because that was one of, one of the aspects of, um, of the book which most fascinated me was this idea of sort of cognitive dissonance between people who on the one hand profess profound love for these, these animals, but on the other hand are treating them in the most appalling way. But I think you've, I th I think you've um, summed up what the root of the problem there entirely. Mm -hmm. Money, and I just wanted to add that you know, it's that cognitive dissonance that you talked about. You can become aware of that cognitive dissonance if you pay attention to what, you, you know, what's going through your mind. And this is where mind, people's minds are shackled. And that's one of the things I try to convey in my book, Gods in Shackles, because if you really allow your mind to open up and see how this cognitive dissonance is playing out, how it is impacting the lives of other animals, how your actions are causing such pain and suffering, um, and it's just inflicting so much suffering on other animals, including cows and goats and snakes, because all of these animals are also exploited for money. So then you will sort of understand this nuance that goes on within the mind the mind is mysterious the mind is insidious and these thoughts that creep into your mind if you don't challenge those thoughts then you end up acting on everything that the mind says and your mind wants you to do this and your mind fuels these thoughts constantly this surges of thoughts oh i get to make so much money greed selfishness all of these things are actually they emerge from your mind, but when you allow the mind to just, you say, okay, okay, let, let me just take a step back, <sighs> take a deep breath, and allow myself just to settle down, then you can allow that breath to, you know, kind of awaken the spirit, and that spirit will come and talk to you and say, okay, well, how is this impacting not just you, how is this benefiting not just you, but the greater good? So I just wanted to throw it out there because Gods and Shackles is not just about elephants. It's about what I'm trying to say here is trying to draw the parallels between the shackled elephants and the suffering caused to the shackled elephants because of the shackled mind. I'm trying to draw this, uh, you know, sort of parallels between, and we suffer too because deep down humans do not want other species to suffer but they don't allow that compassion to emerge they don't allow because they live in the moment right now what am i going to get to make right now let me mm. just make money right now they live you can live in the moment but in that moment you have to be aware you cannot live in the moment and allow that moment to drive you there's a difference subtle difference absolutely uh, I mean, in your opinion, what sort of, um, are there any kind of practices or philosophies or anything that people could kind of investigate to, you know, unshackle their minds in the way that you've just described? Wow, that's, I, I, I do this every single day because honestly, none of us can be f uh, completely unshackled um, if we don't tap into our spirit. We have to go within. There are times that I too, when I get caught up in this massive, oh, I got to get this done, I have to do this, I have to do that, do this, do this, do this, do this, to-do list, check, 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 check. And you don't pay attention to what's going on with your body. So the first thing I do is the minute I feel this sense of urgency to anything and everything, I'm like, okay, stop. And your body will tighten everywhere. Your mind will tighten. You cannot think clearly. The emails you send out or the conversations you have are going to be just so um, impulsive and not responsive. And then you say, okay, no, 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 no. 
take a step back. And what I do is I replenish myself. Before I came to talk to you, Tom, I spend... Uh, I every day I spend like two hours in the wilderness and before I talked with you I did just that I go into the wilderness and I walk like 10 kilometers every single day I have to do it and what I also do is I listen to you know luminaries and I listen to meditation I listen to um, you know, uh, guided imagery. I listen to all of these things. And even when I'm listening, my mind is wandering in 10 trillion directions. And then I bring myself back. I bring myself back. It's a, it's an ongoing. This is what I meant when I said, live in the moment, bring yourself back. And then when you do that, you can speak with so much clarity. You can articulate everything so clearly. You can be compassionate. You can be kind. You can be generous. You can be so loving because that love oozes out of you because you have just connected with the natural world. And the natural world is naturally loving and compassionate. When you look at the creatures of the earth, when you listen to the sounds of the, the melodies of the beautiful birds, when you feel Feel the breeze on your face. You breathe deeply. And you know, when you breathe deeply, you're sending oxygen into every single cell. Do you know that 20% of the oxygen you breathe is taken up by your brain? Really? Yes. So if you don't breathe properly, you're depriving your brain of oxygen. And when you don't give your brain enough oxygen, your brain will not send enough blood in your body and you won't be able to think clearly and your mind is not located in your heart but i think if you went if you connected with your heart you go deep within from all of the superficial stuff you know like your whole the cells of your body is like actually struggling and suffering and you just calm it all down you just go deep within when you're in the natural world and you become one with the birds you become one with the breeze and it just calms you down and every action you take after that every word you speak is going to be so reflective and thoughtful just like the elephants lovely i couldn't agree more yeah i think connected with nature and going within a very uh, absolutely key to understanding yourself and the reality of the world <laughs> Yeah, and I also journal a lot. I really do because there are times that my mind is stormy and I know I have to stop. And I journal, 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 journal. Sometimes I write angry words. I'm like, I'm angry. I'm just going through this insane. I, 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 I hate this thing that is happening in my life. I despise this person for what he said or did or whatever. You know, we all go through that. And then you kind of say, hmm, is it what this person said? Or is it the way I perceived it? Mm. You start asking questions, right? And then and then you slow down and you say, okay, let me just ask this person what this person meant. And then when you talk to that person, you realize, oh, yeah, your mind is cooking up stories. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I, I, do, I mean, I don't want to go off topic, but I think that's one of the one of the things that's most wrong with uh, communication in the modern world. All this, you know, instant <laughs> messaging and everything is, yeah, your mind has to do half the work, doesn't it? <laughs> Yeah, 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 that's exactly true. And, and you, you hit the nail right on because social media, it's like when you get a message on your, um, you know, WhatsApp or anywhere, you're like, I got to respond right now. And you just go Ch -ch 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 -ch, and you respond like, and if it is fun, you know, you just respond in a fun way. But sometimes you end up saying mean things even when you're having fun, mm. right? And Absolutely. of course, it's, I'm not saying you don't have fun. You you are allowed to be sarcastic. You're allowed to do all of that stuff as long as there's no mean mentality. Like there's no meanness behind anything you say, right? I mean, we all have the meanness, but as long as it doesn't hurt other people, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. To, I think. Um, you know anybody who's watching this i think they'd probably be really interested to check out the film and your um your multi-part series um where can people go about doing that is it on streaming services is there a website where can people see the film so uh nine out of 26 films are available on nat geo wild youtube channels and gods and shackles um the film is available on waterbear.com so they can watch the movie for free 
watch for free um, and it's available on um, Amazon Prime actually but I think it's restricted to the United States. I mean Sangeet it's been fascinating to hear all uh, and somewhat harrowing as well to hear uh, about the plight of, of the elephants but obviously you're very actively involved in um, in activism in trying to improve the loss of, of elephants. I mean, could you tell me a little bit about what you and your organization is doing and then maybe a little about what um, ordinary members of the public can do to help? Absolutely. So basically I founded an organization called Voice for Asian Elephant Society and um, it's actually um, the mission is to protect the endangered Asian elephants, specifically in India, because India houses 60% of the world's Asian elephant population. And we do this by, you know, mitigating human elephant conflict. We are, we just recently bought a four acre plot of land. So before I flew to London uh, in June, just this past June, I was in India to inaugurate the four acre plot of land. So this land basically um, is opening up the forest patches. So what I mean by that is at one point in time, the government of Kerala had actually sold the forest land to people. Now what the government is doing is buying off, buying out those um, properties. Um, and these are like plantations inside the forest. So what people do is they sell back the land to the government of Kerala and they move outside. And so um, what we did was we supported the Kerala Forest Department. We bought a four acre plot of land. So there are rubber plantations here, rubber plantations here. There's a forest in between. So we bought this land. So the forest patches on this side and this side can be connected. And so this whole plantation has been cleared up already. And and in order for them to run the plantation, basically they had to protect it with electrical fencing. All the fencing has come off. And I am so excited to share with you that a herd of elephant was just recently seen. A bull elephant was recently seen. And we post all of these things on our social media pages so people can follow us. And we have so many other projects. We are also using technology. Remember I mentioned to you about the um, elephants being killed on the train tracks mm. we have installed ellie sense it's a really sophisticated technology with 100 percent accuracy can you believe so ellie sense is a device that is uh, being designed to protect the elephants and prevent elephant deaths on the deadly train tracks of india and between january and the end of june we have saved almost 250 elephants wow. who were crisscrossing and we documented everything. We have the graphics like during different phases, right? Between January and February, significant crossing because they leave the forest and they come to the cropland and they have to cross over the train track to come to the cropland. So there's lots of, and then between February and March, it was a little bit slow, but between March and uh, June, it intensified. The movement intensified again. So 90 plus 95 in the more, uh, you know, between the, the first half of the year and now, and then in between there were about 10 to 12 elephants. So about 250 plus odd elephants. We have saved through this Elisense device. And we are also installing like solar fencing uh, uh, near the forest fringes. And these solar fencing um, is like government approved. It just gives like a two millimeter, two millisecond zap just a little bit of zap and so elephants and we have amazing camera trap videos of elephants uh, you know trying to touch but they're like no we're gonna just walk away and the whole herd walks away but then there are some cheeky tuskers who you know they, they know they can use their tusks because it doesn't conduct electricity so they actually use the tusks and they still sneak in and then they go and they steal the crops and the farmers they just laugh and so so this so by what not only are we installing these technologies we are also hiring the tribal community this is so critically important because we are trying to get the sense of be, get them to feel that if they protect elephants they're also going to have a livelihood so livelihood and protecting elephants they go hand in hand and so we're helping people we're also helping elephants so it's a win-win situation for both people and elephants and indeed for all of the species and of course on a grander scale for humanity so they can check out all of this stuff on the website that I've provided.
That's fantastic, and we'll make sure that we put the links to all those resources down in the uh, down in the description box of this video. So, Thank Ethan, you. it's been wonderful and inspiring talking to you today. I can only wish you Thank all you. the best for your uh, continued uh, campaigning and activism. And um, yeah, thank you for doing everything that you do. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, I appreciated having this conversation with you. And just so you know, 50% of all proceeds from the sales, uh, they go back to my organization. So people, they can always buy Gods and Shackles book. And you'll put the link to that as well, right, Tom? Oh, so people yeah. can see. There you go. So everybody knows what to Absolutely. look out for. But that's lovely. Absolutely, yeah. Thank so you so much, Tom. Thank you very much. I hope you have a great day. Thank you, you too.